Audiobook Title World Tree Apocalypse A Pilot in Another World Lit RPG 01-04 by Rasmatas. This work belongs to author Rasmatas. Source Royal Road and Scribblehub.com Chapter 01 Pilot and Caretaker A voice calls over the radio screaming to overpower the roar of gunfire and engines another man from his squadron. Suddenly the device crackles the needle sliding along the display as it picks up another frequency cutting off the yelling man's voice. What exactly do you believe in? Asks someone else entirely a woman whose voice now comes from the dashboard mounted radio. The pilot doesn't recognize her, and he doesn't have time to worry about it. It's probably some civilian broadcast that got mixed up with the rest. He slaps the radio with his free hand as static crackles all around him his head turned to the side as he watches trails of bullets streak through the sky. The sharp collective hissing of the electronics is barely able to come to his ears over the mind-rattling drone of the repeating heavy machine gun fire that is raging from all sides. The plane's chassis shakes in response to his demands as if there were a hive nesting inside the aluminum body. The sky on this cloudy day roars with thunder despite there not being a single drop of rain to be seen the crack of heavy auto-cannon projectiles. It's of enemy caliber. Screams come over the radio as the standard frequency is picked up again. None of them are assigned parachutes. The pilot looks back forward flipping two switches in preparation for his maneuver and also doing his best to silence the screaming man's voice coming in from the broadcast. The down man will be screaming all the way down until he hits the ground but there's no need to make that everyone else's problem at a time like this. The pilot looks in the mirror glass at the black silhouette that is rapidly arching up his way on his trail. His squadron has been intercepted on their patrol route by an enemy ambush. The attack came suddenly from an unexpected angle that should have been guarded. The enemy has a new trick up their sleeves. It's funny, really. War has a way of making new things become old very quickly. When they were assigned these new planes they were told they were top-of-the-line experimental aircraft. But now here the enemy is having up the game again with their own new tech. The metal cage around him buzzes. The bare-bones, mostly stripped interior of the cockpit of the single-seated experimental airframe stresses its discontent at the way its body is being treated by the man the pilot in control. He tilts his head back looking up for him as he pulls the plane upward further flying nearly upside down gazing at the shapes below him through the clear glass canopy of the fighter plane. Two aircraft from his own squadron are spiraling downward in a diverging circle maneuver to break apart their formation. Another one is on fire and hurtling down toward the ground still being pursued by their hunter. The JFZ-09 Kestrel is a prototype single-propeller long-range light fighter with a weapon's emphasis toward its design of being an extremely nimble high-altitude but poorly armored combatant intended to push deep into the enemy's defensive locations as the tip of the spear preemptively destroying enemy air assets and ground defenses before any. Supporting friendly ground units make their push. Essentially it's a plane designed solely for suicide missions and nothing else. Modified from the extremely modular JFCX chassis which fields many variants from submarine hunters to heavily armored short-range ground support fighters this newest version has been modified with dual 7.92 by 57 mm flood-fed machine guns deployable explosive cluster ordinances that are technically illegal because they are horrifically inhumane and an internal self-destruction load that acts as the pilot's parachute replacement the latter isn't seen as an issue in the scope of human rights issues. Designed to penetrate the enemy's lines from unusual angles much has been spared to allow an extra large fuel reserve and a special prototype engine only available on this model. Every single gram down to the cushioning of the pilot's seat has been reduced as much as possible giving the interior of the plane very much the appearance and sensation of being an actual coffin. Although the high explosive charges that the plane is filled with really do bring it all together into something homelike. 
This interior sector of the war zone was supposed to have been underwatched by air detection units to keep the skies clear for his squadron on their way to the enemy lines, but nobody warned them about any incoming bogeys. It's really no wonder though. As he cuts the sky like a knife the pilot looks staring at the midnight black hunter plane that has flown after him in pursuit coming closer and closer like a reaching monster's claw against the backdrop of the ever blue sky. It's a new dual propeller design. His fingers grip around the throttle as he watches the heavy autocannon below the enemy's canopy begin to rotate in preparation. He's never seen anything like it. It must be a new enemy prototype some sort of long-range stealth interceptor. It really is fitting for the enemy to bring out such a thing on the same mission that they're on with their new planes too. Now. The cockpit lights up vividly orange in the same instant as he slams the control stick to the right in response to the shine of hammering gunfire his plane spinning and diverging its ascending path as the sustained burst of .50 caliber machine gun fire on his trail cuts through the vector he was following a second ago. He'd recognize that sound anywhere. The enemy tends to field weapons with a lower rate of fire but a harder punch. The machinery howls as he rises further and further his hands pulling back the throttle harder still at his angle rising higher and higher. The Kestrel's engine's voice quickly becomes choked and silent as his ascent begins to fail against the whims of gravity which begins pulling him down to the world. The lift beneath his wings is no longer enough to sustain his rise at this new vector of movement. His excessively sharp angle upward is too much to sustain for as long as he has been doing with the resources he has at hand. The engine stalls out a sickly momentum moving into his gut as he reaches the end of his push and the plane hangs in midair by itself for a moment neither falling or rising. A sharp series of clacks fill the cockpit the man shifting his legs as he flicks off a series of switches in precise order. He yanks the throttle shifting the flaps. His plane spins and his propeller sputters as he free falls and rotates the kestrel straight downward against the drop following the odd somersault through to the end. His vision is filled with the hued gray of the desolated world below that he's crashing towards hidden behind the cotton clouds. The pursuing enemy hunter shoots up and past him at the same second as he blasts down next to it the two men both sparing sideways glances toward their counterpart as they pass each other by for just a brief flash of a second. The Kestrel hurdles down screaming as he presses toward the dogfight that his squadron is entangled in below. He aligns himself with the vector of another enemy hunter chasing one of his guys nestling the black bird snugly in the middle of his hull-mounted crosshair. His index finger presses down against the heavy set trigger on his control stick the machine responding with a deeply set rigid clack that carries up his arm. Then there the mechanism roars his light fighter making its presence known as the swarming of descending fair lights comes to his ears together with the sounds of their biting through the metal of the enemy plane below. At over 1,000 rounds per minute per gun there's nothing else to hear inside the canopy except for the non-stop hammering eruption and the jangling of metal in the ammo canisters behind him. A streaking daisy chain of vivid fire cuts through the top of the enemy hunter below him a pattern of hundreds of bullets blasting out of the weapons array in only a few seconds time. The black enemy fighter plane burns its heavily peppered wing breaking off from the force of the wind raging against its butchered core the damaged airframe unable to hold on any more against the speeds it had been moving at. Fire and smoke trailed down toward the ground as it spirals in a horrifically violent circle down toward the distant gray ocean destined to become one crater of many in the battlefield that has shifted back and forth over the same stretch of land for years now. I just mean you know I do not understand what exactly it is supposed to be, asks the woman's voice from the radio again. Do you just like killing? Is that it? His hand flicks the radio, the needle sliding back to his frequency. A voice of thanks comes in from his squadron mate whom he just saved. There's some soap opera running or something. He's got to talk to the engineers back at the hangar when this is done. Usually military frequencies are cleanly separated from civilian broadcasts. There must be some kinks in the new plane. 
At the same time he can't help but narrow his eyes in annoyance, as the blooming of a parachute makes itself seen the neutralized enemy ejecting from his crashing plane with a very functional and present parachute. Bastard. I just think that it is sad as all, says the voice over the radio with the pilot looking at it in surprise. His confused moment is interrupted as he lurches to the side the airframe taking a heavy hit as something shrill whines behind him. The hunter he dodged a moment ago is back on his ass the wind whistling like a ghost as it dives after him. The pilot can't help but notice the missing chunk of his own wing hurtling through the air behind him. The enemy dodges the scrap. Counterbalancing the disrupted airflow of his glide he leans the plane to the side spinning down at an angle. How many is it? Do you even know? Souls? Asks the radio. The radio crackles a familiar voice coming in belonging to the man in the plane that he's flying straight towards. Waltz. Waltz, replies the pilot into his own radio looking downward at the friendly airframe launching straight up toward him from below one of his own. The allied fighter spins upside down as he maintains his own rotation their two bellies coming close to sliding along one another as his fight is cut into both kestrels firing at the same time. The pilot's kestrel shrieks its guns blasting at the enemy who was pursuing his friendly as his own hunter is shot at from below by the man he swapped targets with like exchanging partners in a dance. Both of the enemy hunters fall apart spiraling downward. One enemy pilot ejects with a parachute. The other his own target does not do so the second time. The sky is clear. That was the last of them. Exhaling the pilot pulls his throttle steady and looks down at his radio as status reports come back in. One after the other the Kestrel pilots check in with their call signs to establish who is still alive and if the mission is still a go. Out of the sides of his canopy four Kestrels return to a wing formation that he's at the front of. Are you not scared? asks the voice from the radio. His fingers flick over the switches one after the other trying to adjust the radio to isolate and shut out the frequency finally. They're approaching the target. Men's voices come over the radio as his fingers rest on it yelling a series of commands in a frenzy just as he was fiddling with the controls. The Kestrel pilot lifts his gaze looking through the glass of the canopy with which there is something very wrong. A pattern is developing over it like interwoven honeycombs. Confused he stares until he realizes that it isn't the glass that is breaking or fracturing but rather the sky itself is enveloped in the webbing. The radio is full of chatter but not about that as nobody else seems to notice oddly enough. Instead what the remaining men of the pilot squadron talk about is what lies straight ahead of them. Over the nearby horizon crests a full swarm of easily two dozen more enemy hunters with another two heavy fighters in their back formation. The trail of their movements distorts and disrupts the honeycomb pattern that is etched into the air as if everything were submerged in a dense liquid like the world was being submerged into a dripping beehive. He must be experiencing some altitude sickness. One day you will end up where you are going. You know that right? Asks the voice taking a sternly disapproving tone that really grinds him the wrong way. She's talking to him personally. Is this some shrink trying to test him? Some psych evaluation from the flight research team? His fist strikes against the console as he pulls the corded radio into his hands pressing down the button and answering with a single word. Good, is all that the Kestrel pilot says as he slams the radio back into the clasp and pushes the throttle of his plane forward as chatter comes from all communication channels orders coming in from Central Air Command for his squadron to immediately pull back and regroup above their own defensive lines. Where he's going? He's not going anywhere. This is war, and it always has been war. War is the only place to go. War spans the world from here to the end of its most distant reaches. He was born in war, he went to school in war, and he grew up in war. He killed his first man at fifteen when he was drafted and they gave him a rifle and by the time he was old enough to sit in a plane he had stopped counting how many it had been. 
He's a natural at what he does. He's driven by it. He loves it. He reaches down grabbing hold of a simple lever at the side of his seat his hand resting on it as the silhouettes of his own squadron begin to diverge the wing formation breaking apart as they all pull back to safety. His thumb presses down on the locking mechanism of the lever releasing it. He's never disobeyed a command before but there's no point in him following these orders and regrouping in the back line. His damaged wing is throttling his speed too much. He won't be able to outrun the enemy at the distance he would have left to go in order to return to the safe zone. They'd gun him down halfway there. So there's only one other viable option, one other direction out of the endless vectors available to a man with wings. The Kestrel's experimental 12-cylinder piston engine is outfitted with a prototype device that he was told he doesn't need to understand. He just needs to know that it works. It's some sort of overdrive mechanism that mixes the fuel with an incredibly volatile propellant for short-term high-intensity situations. It's not enough to get him back out of here the sprint it provides won't last that long to make a difference but the front line is closer than the back line. He can make it to there. The pilot shuts off the radio as a stream of orders is barked his way to return to formation and to leave the engagement zone. The sky ahead of him suddenly shines with wildfire as a full armada of auto cannons and heavy machine guns unload his way in the very same second that he pulls the overdrive lever cranking it up his back and helmet slamming against the loveless hard seat that he's strapped into. The Kestrel shoots forward like a banshee escaping sunrise straight toward the mass of enemy interceptors the oddly structured air all around him wobbling and distorting as if he were an arrowhead rupturing through gel as he yanks the throttle the Kestrel flowing into a barrel roll as it glides through a tunnel of projectiles. The only place he is going is where he's always been the only place that's familiar to a man with no name and only a designation as an identity, the only place of purpose that he has that place is wherever he can be to advance their lines one day forward, wherever he can be to kill just one more of the enemy's numbers to move the mission just an inch closer toward success. Nothing else matters. Here in the burning skies above the world that is locked into a decades-long war flying over the ashen grave sites of some countless million screaming dead souls he's already at home. His body and plane are cut through by hundreds of bullets at once. His hand presses down onto the self-destruction mechanism cracking the glass housing before the high explosive charge erupts and swallows the distorted sky a cadre of enemy planes and him whole in a wave of fire and shrapnel. This here this is where he's going if anywhere at all. His senses come to an end and for the first time in any year of his life there is no sound of gunfire, no roaring of engines, no screaming of voices in command or anguish, no thunderous explosions of mortar fire and artillery. For the first time ever for the man everything is quiet. And it remains so until a single voice finally chimes in coming to him and possibly through the filtering sound of radio static as if he were still inside the Kestrel's cockpit. Perfect, says that woman's voice, her tone changing from its prior lofty condescension and into something more appraising and motherly. You are exactly what I need. Even now in death the sensation of him falling never stops. Welcome. The final apocalypse has begun. A great rod has begun to spread across the world as a monster invasion unfolds over the continents. Their goal is to ravage the land and destroy the world tree killing its last caretaker and breaking all hope for the goodness of life to ever thrive again. Given your aptitude and personality you have been chosen to prevent this from happening at any cost. Failure to do so will result in the death of the world and everything in it. The rest is up to you. Good luck. Time until next invasion unknown. Status. Level 01. Plane JFZ-09 Kestrel. Class Pilot. Subclass None. Health October 10th. Soul 15-15. EXP 00-10. Abel 000. A Dryad. Level 10. Female Sign. 
class caretaker. Soft bird song fills the air together with the shrilling of many insects and the croaking of frogs their combined songs creating the fitting soundscape to match the gentle atmosphere all around her, and she sings softly to her voice joining the melody, as she lets free the wordless song that her sister would always sing to her when she was scared. The winds of springtime softly push through the glades and the forest clearings carrying over and onto the water of the great lake that is fed by so many rivers. The air smells of floral perfume as blossoms flower by the thousands all across the valley and let it be known that life finds itself within a good season. The dryad turns her head smiling and watching a fat pleasantly buzzing bee fly toward her face. It stops and floats around her for a moment as if wondering if she were one of the many blossoms before then flying off to find something more familiar after realizing that she is not. Turning her head around she watches it go buzzing towards the monumental thing that towers over the forest of many trees and the lake of many rivers. The World Tree Thriving there in the middle of what may very well be paradise is the single largest organism on the entire planet a single tree whose roots can span across a continent, and whose leaves and branches rest up in the sky so very high above. It takes days to walk around its base. Its leaves in the millions fall and regrow in the amounts of drifting snowflakes in winter on any casual day being carried off far and wide by the powerful air currents present up so high in the sky spreading its magical essence all around the world to everywhere that the wind graces and that the leaves might land upon. The water that seeps through its roots the pollen that swirls around its bark the air that straddles its colossal mass all of these things are blessed and touched by its nurturing power and carry the imbuing strength it gives them all across the world. It does so indiscriminately. The essence that the world tree gives off it gives its gifts to the men of the fortresses and to the elves of the caverns just as it gives its gifts to the orcs of the wildlands and the dwarves of the mountains. It gives these gifts to the animals of the old places of every part of the world just the same as it gives them to the monsters of the horrible regions where none dare to walk. Nature does not discriminate. It only provides and takes in appropriate measures. Air water magic all manner of things are provided to the world as a whole by the world tree and she alone is the sole caretaker of it remaining. All of the others have left one by one there having been a need for them in the aching reaches of the dying world that needs more healing than there are hands and souls to provide. All of them have gone to counteract the bleak tide that is slowly ebbing toward the world tree. There used to be dozens of them caretakers. Then only a handful. Then it was just the two of them her and another sister. She isn't sure if she is imagining it but every night is a little longer than the one that came before these days and every dream that comes to her in her sleep is just a little darker and more frightening. Something snarls at her from the side. She turns her head looking at the startled young bear that had been foraging through the blueberry bushes. In her daydreams she had stumbled straight into it. After recognizing her the animal lowers its head again and continues on as if nothing ever happened. Are you well today? Asks the caretaker her hand stroking the bear's fur as she walks past it the bear ignoring her presence now. Oh! She stops looking down to the side and then rubbing the animal's belly feeling it. The bear is with yum. Congratulations, she says letting her hand fall from the expecting animal and rise to the bushes. Caretaker has used enhanced growth. The blueberry bush that the bear is picking clean swells as the magic of her spell causes the plant to drink deeply of the rich world pulling in vital resources and producing a swelling load of thick dripping berries in the span of a few moments, their soft, tautly skinned bodies bursting from oozing juice. Eat well. Smiling peacefully to herself, she walks through the dense, thriving forest the likes of which is to be found nowhere else in the world. The soil here beneath the canopy of the world tree is saturated with nutrients and deep minerals. The dirt is moist and rich. Life thrives here in abundance. Sister calls the dryad as she reaches her goal, gently pushing aside the brambles of the forest. Sister, I've come she says stepping into the sunlit glade her sister's favorite spot. 
In a way it was very fortunate for it to have been here of all places. Stopping the caretaker stands there at the edge of the clearing and looks into it at the heap of things laying in the open grass under the sunlight. Her sister's corpse lies there covered in a blanket of bark from the world tree. Desiccators native to the area and legions have begun their work of taking the dead body and returning it to the world. Mushrooms have begun sprouting from the exterior of the bark feeding on the corpse together with countless insects and worms that move it around up and down as if the dead body below were still breathing. This is the natural way. There is only one dried left. She had found her sister dried dead only a day ago taken exactly here where she lies now. A knife was pressed through her made of crude sharp metal. It seems that the monsters have finally begun to reach the edges of the territory. The great rot has finally found the world tree's garden. Kneeling down in the grass at the edge of the clearing she stares at her sister whom she has come to visit before the body is fully devoured and broken down by the natural order and her spirit moves on and back into the cycle of rebirth. She talks to her telling her about such things as her feelings and the fond memories she has shared with her. It hurts. But this really is the way of life. Animals, people, and monsters, they all kill and eat one another interchangeably. It is the exchange that nature created. Come back soon, sister, says the dryad quietly lowering her head and placing a palm down to touch the ground beneath herself far from the corpse in which worms and mycelial roots have already begun to return the body to the world. The forest, the grass, the animals, they all take from her sister and grow in turn. She hasn't seen the culprit, but she assumes it to have been a goblin given the weapon that she hasn't touched. It lies where it fell in the rocks by the dead trees. Goblins are vicious small monsters that are more cruel than intelligent. It did not eat her sister so the killing was for sport. This too is not unheard of in nature. Large cats, birds, there are many animals that hunt not for food but for the sake of it. Her hands still touching the world feel the energies moving through it. She listens to the whispering of the roots of the trees in the forest and to the secret hushed words and tones given in return by the mushrooms the two creations of life often interacting with one another. She hears as they talk of the great rot. From all across the world one root touches another. A tree near a mountain touches the roots of grasses below the peaks. The grasses spread across the tundra where their roots touch the shrubbery of the boreal forests. Those roots connect and talk to one another spreading out in all directions from one forest to the next to the next as the flowers speak to the trees which speak to the mushrooms and so on. A word whispered on the other end of the world makes its way through this great chain of life resounding out in all directions. The plants never do have much to say but when a single word makes its way across the whole of the world it is one of significance. And for a time now there has only been one single phrase uttered by the connected hive mind of all living things. Rot. A great rot the great rot has begun spreading from the other side of the world. Day by day it consumes more and more. The march of the dead things corrupts the world and its beautiful natural places as legions of monsters roam and rampage in a way that none have ever seen before. The great cities of the people of the world fall one after the other to the horde. The meadow mice drown in lakes of blood sickering down into the deep burrows from above. One fortress after the other one group after the other falls and the monsters keep on marching. And soon the great rampage, the great desecration will have made its way here to the last mark of true pure natural love and life on the world, the world tree. There is nothing that anyone can do to stop it. Not her, not any of the great kings or armies of legend. No hidden fortress in the mountains can be overseen and no ship out at distant sea can go unnoticed. Everything will die. Everyone. Population die-offs are also not unheard of in the natural world. Sometimes a species comes and simply replaces another one. There is nothing that anyone can do to stop it. Lifting her gaze, tears fall from her face as she mourns her dead sister wondering how long she has left herself as would any animal of intelligence and soul. 
The sun flickers a shadow casting down from over her head for a brief second. Confused, she covers her eyes and lifts her gaze in surprise watching as a streak of black smoke and raging flames are cast down to the world below from the thick clouds of what feels like it ought to be a good day. A falling meteor rips through the sky from the horizon above hurtling downward faster than she can follow. She jumps to her feet in shock watching it and feeling the heat of its presence overhead for just a moment as it shoots above her close enough to scorch the treetops before a loud violent crashing comes from the lake behind her hidden beneath the horizon-spanning shadow of the world tree. The dryad runs back the way she came toward the edge of the water fully unaware of the thing that had been skulking behind her in the dense forest as she mourned quietly creeping closer and closer by the second. Chapter 2 Goblin A Dryad Level 10 Female Sign Class Caretaker The Dryad finally makes her way out to the lake a while after the crash. Skulking at the edge of the water of the great waters the caretaker stares out at the hissing thing that floats on the blue surface. Steam rises up into the air the water of the lake reacting to the superheated presence of whatever has crashed into it. Usually the waters of the lake are deeply selfish swallowing and keeping whatever they take. However this thing it floats instead. A dragon? No. It has the size of a young drake but it isn't something that is or was alive. Even in whatever state it is and she can tell that its body is inorganic. The lines are too straight the mass is too rigid and the nature of it is too unnatural. It is a creation of some kind of construction. A dark oozing liquid leaks out of its side like the black blood of a demon staining the lake's surface as it begins to drift atop the water. Fire spreads from the dark gray body and out over the water as the corrupted blood burns. It does so for a while until it then burns itself out doing a harm to the ecosystem that she is unable to quantify. Deeply perplexed, and not sure what to do she watches the area for a moment, and then touches the water of the lake with her hands. Caretaker has used Flow Adaptation The gently ebbing current of the lake water changes a rippling circle building on the surface where her spell collides as if the wind were pressing down against it in a circle from above. The tide ebbs the large gestalt toward the shore little by little until it reaches the rocks and the crystal sand. Wading carefully into the water with bare feet she cautiously lifts a hand and lets it hover above the thing's body for a moment before then quickly testing it with a light slap of her fingers. She pulls back her hand looking at it. This thing is made out of metal. The construction is pockmarked with deeply penetrating holes and scars like the wings of an ancient beast after centuries of feuds and fights over dominion and power. Scorch marks cover it along with a muck of ash grease and substances that she can't identify. There's a smell in the air that burns her nose and is highly acidic. She does not like it. The side of it is covered in paintings all inorganic and stiff as well not markings of joy and love. Straight lines and scrawls adorn the body more akin to the sigils and runes of warfaring tribes than something born of an artistic glow. Fish swim around her legs slowly returning to the area. She takes this as a good sign. Fish are suspicious if not exactly the most clever animals. The caretaker lifts her gaze looking at a mostly clear cracked bauble that sits atop its wings. There are vivid streaks of blood all over the inside glistening in the sunlight as if the object had eaten something and this dome was its translucent belly. Hoisting herself up onto the wing's water sloshing down her body, as she does so the dried balances herself on the floating construct, and cautiously peers into it. Inside is a holobird cage smeared with red all around as if it had imprisoned a trapped animal that had been pierced with many spears. But there is nothing there now. It's empty. What is this thing? The dryad steps back looking around the lake in confusion. Everything has returned to how it was apart from one detail. Something is off, but she fighting her overloaded senses and overwhelming thoughts doesn't know exactly what that is. 
Everything seems to be as it should be barring this oddity that she can't explain to herself. Looking back at the construct not sure what to do with or about it she slowly climbs back down into the water again and returns to the shore staring at it for a time as the generous spring sun dries her body. The caretaker does not know much about the ways of humanity having spent all of her life here. But she knows that nobody has ever told her about anything like this. Humans are clever animals capable of making all sorts of things from carriages to complex monuments that hope to mimic the scale of the world tree. But whatever this construct here is that looks like a bird it clearly was one of their less fortunate if not more creative endeavors. She can only assume that they in their panic to avoid the great rot had tried to learn the secrets of flight to escape it. It appears to have ended as one would expect from such unnatural foolishness. Even she knows that not even the birds in the sky can escape the foulness that is spreading. Her sister Dryads had always told her not to think so ill of the humans that it is simply their natural state to defy nature as with any other sentient species, but she had always found a bit of an irk whenever she heard a news story about a forest destroyed for wood and space a rare beast hunted for trophies or a mountain enclave mined for jewels. And or. Shaking her head she turns around having decided to return to her day. This strange object is a curiosity for sure but there doesn't seem to be much else here. She has other tasks that she must attend to that take priority. She'll come back to this later once she finds out what to do with it. Her many thoughts carrying between this unusual situation the unusual situation from yesterday and her own confused emotions come to a quick sudden halt as she suddenly and finally realizes something the thing that had been bothering her a moment ago. Quietly lifting her eyes to the tree lean the dryad listens. There is no birdsong anymore. There are no buzzing insects. There are no croaking frogs. There are no bees and no grasshoppers and no fish splashing in the body of the lake behind her. It is totally quiet. Her eyes slowly widen as she realizes what this means the presence of a predator. Whenever danger is around all animals fall silent so that they aren't the thing that is taken. By the time she finishes turning her head to the side she doesn't have time to react as a heavy rock strikes against her skull. A loud disgusting crack runs through her head as she falls down to the wet sands of the shoreline her vision spinning as she instinctively crawls back and away in an animal terror but something yanks on her leg gripping her ankle and pulling her back through the wet sand. Caretaker has been struck by a goblin. You have taken. Zero two. Damage. Status applied. Bleeding zero one. Dazed zero one. Her blurred, terrified, and confused eyes look back at the green silhouette standing over her. A goblin. In that delirious moment she knows that she should lift her hands and cast some sort of spell to defend herself, but she doesn't. Her mind is stuck frozen as it finds itself thinking instead of doing. The dryad has never fought anything before except for the odd wrestling match with her sisters during better days. She doesn't know how to defend herself even if she wants to. Dryads have always lived in peace beneath the world tree. There were never any monsters here. There were never any threats to her kind at all. Food is abundant, the water is clean and plentiful. Humans, elves, orcs, or any of the other common races are unable to enter beneath its eminent shadow as their magic repels them from entering. This garden, the valley, is essentially a secluded paradise in which there has never stepped foot anything that can be considered dangerous, until now. The fact that she's about to die. It just it's so quick, isn't it? Wait, she's going to die. Her new thoughts catch up with her own prior thoughts as she thinks herself into a circle not sure why she isn't doing something else. She's frozen like a doe staring at sunrise. The dryad knows that it's an odd thought as she lies on her back trying and failing to get up to crawl away as she looks at the silhouette of something man-shaped standing over her holding a bloodied rock over its head with one gangly hand and holding her leg firmly with the other. But she was just living life a second ago, and now she's. 
It strikes the rock against her a second time and she screams the sensation of the fracturing moving through her body from the top down causing a deep nausea in her gut as she kicks and flails trying to fight the monster off. Her blurred eyes can't keep up with the updating status windows flashing with critical colors as she's attacked. She wonders if this is what her sister thought too right before it happened to her. It was so fast. The last caretaker struggles as best as she can in her locked-in state losing more and more momentum and strength as the goblin continues to bash her with the sharp rock blood splattering everywhere her panicked wild efforts proving to be unfruitful against the prepared stalker and attacker. She can barely see anymore. Her vision is flooded with blood. Sand crunches. The goblin on top of her is casually approached from the side by another silhouette. A person. The human holds something rigid and metallic and dark against the side of the head of goblin crystal grit crunching beneath black boots as the new figure comes to a stop. It's a human in soaked stone gray puffy clothes. He's covered in blood and the marks of an inferno's kiss and his head is hidden behind a shattered mask of war with striped adornments. A single sharp crack ruptures the air her head feeling as if it had been struck one last time by the blood-painted rock as the sound channels through her body, and everything that lies deeper within. Fire escapes his hand. Thousands of birds shoot out of the forest as the sudden noise reverberates out and across the valley over and over again. The strike of a single heavenly hammer echoes across the great lake a hundred times over before the monster has finished falling over dead before the spray of skull fragments and inner matter has landed on the shore. A single second passes after that time slowed moment. The battle is over. Pilot has executed Goblin. Plus 10 EXP. Goblin Scout. A Goblin Scout. Blurring the line between the core races of the world and monsters goblins have firmly chosen their side as belonging to the latter group. They are notoriously clever and vicious creatures with keen animal instincts and enough intelligence to maintain their own language culture and violent tribal society. Spread around the world goblins prefer to live in a collective gathering of many small groups commonly in shared cave systems and forests. This particular goblin is a scout a lightly equipped quick goblin who was chosen for the role because of its particularly lanky and light build. Entity Monster Rank F Element None Type Primitive Plus Level Up Plus Pilot has leveled up to level 02. New Ability Munitions Regenerate Sidearm Passive Fully restores the munitions count of your sidearm every 24 hours. The slain goblin falls over and off of her splashing into the water of the lake and leaking out into it. In that same instant the man falls over just the same falling the other way and moving no more. Dazed and terrified the dryad crawls back now that she is free scrambling away with several strides and fistfuls of coarse sand until she falls down herself again turning around to look back behind her at the two bodies lying there at the end of the generous trail of her own blood as she finally catches her breath and her vision slowly stops to spin despite the throbbing in her head. Red runs down her lacerated face as she watches the chest of the human man who saved her gently rise and fall much the same as her sister's corpse beneath the burial shroud much the same as the ebbing water of the lake. The great tree that cuts into the sky behind the sight of him sways ever so gently in the great gale that sails across the world its millions of leaves rustling audibly and almost sounding like the quiet hissing of rain. Chapter 3 Healing what exactly is she supposed to do here? Having tended to her own wounds, the dryad had brought the human back to a place of safety, the den. Transporting him was simple enough using a sled of dead wood and old ropes. They used such things themselves now and then when carrying the heavy stones of rockfalls and such out of the way. Dryads are physically strong things very in tune with their bodies and the natural world. With the rewards of a life outside in nature together with a little help from a sled she had managed to drag the puffy man all the way back around the lake and to the den. 
the goblin she left where it died just the same as it had done for her sister. This is as nature wishes. The dead stay still. The living are those who move. The bear, the insects, the fish, the desiccators, they might now eat them both as is natural and in accordance with the laws of the world. The caretaker stares at the puffy man whom she has hoisted onto the bedding made of old crunch leaves of the world tree and rolls of its flaked bark. He continues to breathe but his body is broken cut and pierced. His deeper gaping wounds seem to have been haphazardly filled with some sort of dispersed soft fabric that was hastily pressed into them like a rag forced into a sap-leaking tree, but it as well as all of his clothes are soaked through by sticky red and the cleansing waters of the lake. It's odd. Her fingers squeezing the edge of his sleeve run over the material. It feels cold and oddly scratchy. But the body of the material is very puffy as if filled with a considerable amount of padding. His helmet has cracked and fractured as his body is set aside next to him. His skin is marked and scarred by days of sun conflict and fire, and his hair is the color of soot to match. He is not from this region. The men of this land have hair of ochre and would not black like this like her own. As for the helmet, it is not uncommon for knights to wear helmets that hide their faces and heads, but she has never seen or heard of one that is quite so rounded or with a visor of obsidian glass. As a prey animal, she should be dead now. It's somewhat hard to think about honestly, but it's true. Dryads are not well capable of killing or fighting. Their magic is unsuited to it and their bodies, while strong, are often hampered by their more diminutive size and their deeply pacifistic culture. The world tree and its shadow have always been safe. The ill will of both monsters and men had never tread foot here held at bay by the world tree's protective powers. So her species has dedicated themselves to safekeeping, protecting, and helping to nurture it. However, those days have now ended with the crisis that looms large. Many dried also subscribe to a philosophy of true pacifism no matter what the circumstances believing that violence is never the way. In an ironic sense this pacifism of theirs is perhaps deeply unnatural, and so it is a strange contrast to the holistic mannerisms of the species as every wild animal in the world will fight desperately with tooth and claw to preserve its life. However this is the one tenet that many have always followed. Such a societal development is only natural for a society that has had no threats or predators of any kind for generations upon generations now. In the eyes of these once guiding voices of Dryad Society Limited as it was a Dryad is only ever allowed to use its abilities for the sake of healing, helping, and nurturing never for violence or harm under any circumstances. They may not do so to protect anyone else themselves or even the world tree. Their lives are only present to act as givers to the world. This is sacred and cannot be defied. She had never delved so deeply into these matters being too young to be concerned with the nature of politics and personal beliefs so she is confused about what to feel. Her body aches and pains and so does her inside because she feels like she should have kicked harder struck harder bitten and clawed so that she would have fended off the goblin herself. Yet if many sisters were around to have seen her do so she would have been shunned even if it was in an act of defense for her life. She doesn't know what to think. This human killed the goblin that had taken her sister and was about to take her too. As such she owes him a debt for doing something that she could perhaps never do. On the other hand, she stares down at him not able to stop wondering if these events aren't somehow his fault. It seems like quite a coincidence that all of these happenings came at once. However, even in her grief-addled mind, she can't create a conspiracy that blames the deaths on him as his arrival came the latest, so instead she relents and accepts the fact that she has no choice in the matter to come. The human helped her, so she must help him. The trees give sugar to the mushrooms, and the mushrooms give minerals to the trees. The flowers give pollen to the bees and the bees pollinate them in turn. Reciprocity there is an exchange present in nature between those things that are aligned. 
fiddling for a time trying to figure out the many clasps and mechanisms she undoes the puffy clothes and begins setting to work on creating a healing salve to apply to his burns and cuts. The deeper wounds she must close with the help of sticky sap to hold the skin together and magic to regenerate the lost flesh. His broken bones must be set. Pieces of sharp metal that have penetrated his flesh stick out from him like the broken fangs of a wolf and must be removed. There is a lot to do. Hours have passed. She pulls out the last piece of metal lightly working it from side to side as she extracts it from his body. As she pulls the sharp bent thing free a stream of blood oozes out immediately afterward to fill the new gap. Holding a folded roll of soft bark against it she pads the wound closed and presses it firmly until the blood cakes and dries holding the bark all by itself. Then taking the dense herbal cream that she's made and leaning over him she looks at his chest staring at the many old scars. They have a form like a dozen spider's webs arching out in many directions from central masses of contrastingly pale skin. They seem like the marks of arrows that have run through his body. Her eyes wander back up to his face. She screams. The human's hands shoot up in an instant one of them grabbing hold of her antler and roughly twisting her head the other pulling a silver knife out from the side of his leg. The two of them roll and crash down to the floor next to the bedding with her down on her front and him on top of her back her head forcefully angled to the side as he pulls the sharp blade against her neck panting for air as if he had been running for days on end. Wait, wait. She calls trying to assure him that everything is okay as she lifts her hands slowly next to her head the metal pressing against her skin as the man frantically looks around himself. She recognizes that gaze on his face as she looks back out of the side of her eyes. It isn't the expression of someone who is present and fully there. It is the look of an animal that doesn't know where it is like that of a fox trapped down in a collapsed burrow. There's nothing that she can say that will reach him right now in his adrenaline-fueled survival drive. But as she speaks explaining her intentions she realizes something. Humans don't speak the dryad language. Her mind racks itself on what to do before she dies after all today and before she can come to a collected consensus of thoughts she hears her sister's voice echoing around in the den singing that soft song she always sang whenever she herself had gotten scared. Surprised her eyes wander through the space until she realizes that it's her own voice. There's hardly a less aggressive gesture than singing right? The hand lets go of her antlers stopping the forced craning of her neck as the weight on her back shifts. Slowly she slides free and looks at the man who is slumped against the bedding looking down at himself and the bloodied removed fabric all around him. Gore soaked soft bark lies in heaps everywhere having been used to clean the skin before she applied the ointments and medicine. He's still wild in demeanor but seems to be coming to himself. Rare, herbal ointment. A potent mixture of rare herbs the shells of dead fruitwood beetles and the root powder of the world tree this strong ointment can be applied to any manner of wound and combined with a magical release to prevent infections from developing in the body. Effect when applied to any open wounds it greatly reduces the chance of stacking status, infection, developing and numbs the area. Weight 200 milliliters. Value. Rare sleeping medicine. Concocted from the harvested venom sacs of dead world tree spiders this potent medicine has been distilled over and over again to reduce the deadly venom down to a strong sedative effect. Effect when consumed adds stacking status, exhaustion, to critical levels. Caution this medicine is deadly in doses too large for the body to handle. Weight 10 milliliters. Value. She almost died twice today. Looking to the side at the spilled cream she crawls over toward it and scoops it back together as best she can on a large leaf of the world tree. The two of them stare at one another from across the small room over the top of the outwardly held knife as she holds it out toward him gesturing in a circular motion with her free hand around her chest in an attempted explanation. She isn't sure if it works or not as the two of them just quietly stare for a while longer. 
But then the human man takes the leaf picking up on her meaning and follows through sticking his fingers into the ointment rather carelessly. However, instead of applying it, he smells it and recalls wincing once from that and then again a second time from moving his injured body so quickly. Unsure, he looks back at her encouraging gestures and then begins to apply the medicine himself, although he makes a mess of it sloppily applying uneven globules of the ointment before just hammering it in with a series of slaps and smears like he was squishing berries. At this point she can't watch anymore and approaches taking over with a scolding tone. He seems to allow it this time as he finally leans back and closes his eyes his rattling breath continuing as she does a much better job at it than he had. By the time she's finished going everywhere that he allows her to she's hummed the song a few dozen times and her hands are covered in an oily mixture of blood ointment and wound fluid. The dried presses both of her palms against his chest. Caretaker has used cure hard anointment. Success. Status. Bleeding. 02. Infection. 01. Burn. 03. Removed. Plus 16 EXP. A light presses itself between her palms and his skin. The ointment that was applied to his many severe wounds crackles and hardens, stiffening like dried leather, as it seals the many exterior openings, patching him whole with something akin to skin. It will take much time to heal injuries of this nature and severity inside the body but at least for now he's safe from bleeding and infection. Reaching out he takes the ointment from her hand gesturing for her to lean over toward him. The dried blinks realizing that the human man wants to apply the medicine to her. No, she remarks waving her hands which she realizes are still shaking from earlier. The tired man says something in a language she doesn't understand and repeats his motion. She blinks unsure. Then not really sure why exactly she gives in somewhat awkwardly and leans to the side toward him letting him dab the ointment this time somewhat more carefully than he was before on her bruising broken and cut places. She could have done it herself so she's not sure why he wants to do this. He's in much worse shape all things considered. After this is finished she uses her spell on herself to harden the ointment, and the man finally gives in to his fight against wakefulness as he allows her to give him the sleeping medicine. He immediately falls to rest lying on the floor rather than on the bedding behind him from which he had started. The dryad does the same collapsing instead into her sister's bed and taking in the smell imprinted into the fabric as she dreams of nostalgic days that were less complicated. Chapter 4 Plane A Man Level 01 May Assign Class Pilot The night passes. He doesn't know what's happening as he drifts in and out of sleep over and over again waking up every so often to find the girl hovering over him with a face covered in oil-smeared bruises and marks. She adjusts some of his wrappings and pushes his head back down every time he tries to get up. He's messed up pretty badly. He knows that much for sure. His mind wanders throughout the delirious mixture of his half-dreams until the morning comes and he tries to rise again only to be forced back down by his host as was the case during the entirety of the night. His body isn't responding like he needs it to but that's not surprising. It's in a serious recovery state. But he can't just stay here in this woman's hut or whatever this is. He has to radio back home and establish an evacuation. Did he crash behind enemy lines? No, how could that be possible? He. His eyes stare blankly into a wall as a wooden bowl is held to his mouth and tipped lightly so that the rich broth inside of it flows past his lips. He remembers. He was in the air. He self-destructed. He heard that voice, that stranger on the radio, and then the man's glazed eyes widen as he shoots upright inadvertently knocking the bowl out of the girl's hands. Soup spills and splashes everywhere as the wooden bowl rattles across the compacted dirt and stone floor. 
She fusses fuming about something and shoving him back as she looks at the mess barely rising to her feet before he's on his way limping to the door of the domicile that is covered by nothing except strings of beads bracing himself on everything he can to stay upright one hand making sure his insides stay where they ought to as he goes. Two hands pull him back and he shoves her away making a stopping gesture. Thanks. We're even now says the pilot looking at her and lifting his hand in a stopping motion. He looks past her at the wet floor. Sorry about the mess. He apologizes grabbing what looks like a rag to help clean it up. She snatches the cloth from his hands and he's sure she's about to drag him back to the bed. So he quickly limps off toward the trees he sees just outside instead well aware that he isn't wearing his uniform right now. He has to know where he is. The air outside is gently hot stemming from a baseline of pleasantly temperate. The temperature is significantly different from the depths of the winter that he had been in during that assault on the enemy position when he was in the air. The man breaks out along a small path that leads outward moving forward below a small canopy of greenery until he finds himself standing on the edge of a steep ledge high above the lake that he recognizes from above. It shimmers in the daylight. The wind blows tousling his matted hair as he stares out at the wide world beyond that he is able to view from here seeing all the way to the distant horizon from the peak above an impossibly green valley that he finds himself atop. Down below him is an azure lake deeply sapphire blue in its hue and there even visible from here is the wreckage of the kestrel washed ashore by the ebbing waters. The inside of the valley is nothing but deep forest rock formations and meadows full of many flowers and vibrant colors that he doesn't even recognize outside of him having seen them in faded books and prints. Slowly the pilot looks back behind himself, and at the fussing fuming girl walking his way again his brain really registering that she has antlers on her head for the first time despite him having already held them in his hands once as his gaze slowly starts to rise past her staring up further and further until his neck can crane upward no more. He looks at the colossus that he stands in the shadow of. A tree? Like a mountain it cuts up further than he can gaze its highest boughs nearly invisible to the eye as they hide in the cover of the clouds above. His head spins. He's not sure if it's from the strange food and medicine his grim injuries, or just the delirium of the situation. Hurrying as best as he can the wounded pilot makes his way down the path fighting off the stranger who keeps trying to drag him back neither of them really having the strength to ward off the other entirely. Standing at the edge of the kestrel panting for breath the sweat-covered soldier stares at the plane's wreckage. It doesn't look as bad as he thought but the plane definitely won't fly without someone to look it over. The engineers and him are going to get into a real fist fight if they run into each other after this. Them because he wrecked their plane. Him because they made him fly in such an uncomfortable shitbox. But that's assuming that's a possibility. He climbs onto the wing and his host's practicality screams as she clutches her short black hair watching the deeply wounded man balance his way over the tepid water of the lake that threatens to undo all of her hard work. Her behavior reminds him of the fresh nursing staff back home. They're also always so involved. But by the time they serve a few years they burn through and just let you walk off to die if that's what you want to do. His hands release the locking mechanism for the cockpit. The canopy opens. Looking inside at the mess he left there through the many holes he finds what he's looking for. Grabbing the radio the pilot flicks it on. It should have an independent power source assuming everything isn't waterlogged. The canopy itself looks dry enough though. The pilot switches through the radio's channel squawking into it but never receiving anything back except for the sound of rainfall static white noise that sounds lidged. There's nothing on board that can help him. There's no survival rifle, no emergency ration, no field kit, nothing. The designers really meant it when they inserted the self-destruction mechanism which he doesn't quite understand the existence of right now. Lifting the chair he looks down beneath it at the explosive charge that he is very sure he himself had detonated. He's very sure he died. And yet. 
here it is. The kestrel is whole more or less, and so is he more or less. The only thing that isn't right is the world. The pilot slowly closes the canopy of the kestrel turning around to look at his fussing rescuer standing there with arms so tightly crossed that they could choke out a brigadier general. Then he turns his gaze looking at the swelling small green corpse that is rotting on the side of the lake. Walking down the wing back to the sands he thinks, and then looks up at the stranger who seems to be following him. Adler's girl. Small green monster. Giant tree larger than the world's tallest mountain. Him being alive instead of very, very dead. With all of this together with the memory of the voice he heard on the radio as he died he thinks that it's safe to say that he isn't in the enemy nation anymore or anywhere he's ever heard of for that matter. Sitting down on a rock the pilot stares at the kestrel. He points at its destroyed body and then at himself as the annoyed girl looks at him perhaps wondering if he's going to give in now. I'm a pilot. He explains pretty sure that they don't even speak the same language. I crashed here. Where are we? He asks looking around the area. Something catches his eye in the sand. Grunting he bends down picking up something small and shiny from the shore of the lake. She stares at him curiously not quite understanding his words it would seem. They really don't speak the same language. A moment later something appears floating in the air. A window glassy and clear about the size of the length of one of his arms. Pilot has gathered normal brass bullet casing. 7.92 by 57 millimeters. This is the casing of the bullet he fired yesterday when he killed the goblin. Ha! Huh. It's some kind of display a screen. A second later with the pieces pulling together out of his memory he gets his idea and touches the window. Status. Level. Zero two. Plane. JFZ-09 Kestrel. Class. Pilot. Male sign. Subclass. None. Health. 03 slash 14. Soul. 19 19 EXP. 00 slash 20. Obels. 000. Well damn, says the man rising to his feet too quickly before then wincing and keeling over in one swift movement. She catches him grabbing his shoulders as he looks up her way tapping on the glassy screen of the manifested window to show it to her. The antlered girl looks her eyes widening. Eh? Ah. Uh. She says seemingly realizing something as he stands back upright looking his way with an understanding smile. Pillet. Pilot, he repeats tapping his chest and then pointing at the plane. Pilot, she repeats nodding as he stands back upright as best as he can. She lightly strikes her own chest with a flat palm. Caretaker, says the woman with a strong accent that emphasizes the vowels and adds a strong H tone to the end of them opening a window of her own. This seems to be some kind of introduction. Status. Level. 10. Class. Caretaker. Female sign. Subclass. None. Health. 21 slash 21. Soul. 50 fiftieths. EXP. 93 slash 170. Obels. 000. Interesting. So this display seems to list their professions along with some other values that he hasn't deciphered yet. The pilot nods looking back down at the brass casing in his hands for a moment. He then flicks it into the air toward her walking off. The dried yelps in surprise catching the shiny thing before it falls and then looks at it perplexingly for a time before her eyes open in a display of sudden shock. Caretaker takes a moment her face turning back between him and the casing a few times seemingly taken aback. She yells incoherently throwing the brass far out into the water with quite a good arm actually. 
The single bullet casing that had ejected from his pistol when he killed the goblin flies far out into the lake. It splashes into the water sinking away into the blue. Confused he looks at her lost expression and then shrugs. He supposes that she doesn't like bullets. The pilot gets left behind as the caretaker very quickly vanishes for a while. He assumes that they're done with whatever this was now and begins making plans for how to salvage the kestrel while observing a new window he has found his way to that makes the situation more clear in one sense even if it does raise many many other questions. Mission The final apocalypse has begun. A great rot has begun to spread across the world as a monster invasion unfolds over the continents. Their goal is to ravage the land and destroy the world tree killing its last caretaker and breaking all hope for the goodness of life to ever thrive again. Given your aptitude and personality you have been chosen to prevent this from happening at any cost. Failure to do so will result in the death of the world and everything in it. The rest is up to you. Good luck. Time until invasion. Zero seven days. He swipes it away and returns to his planning. Before the hour is over and he has used what little strength that he has available caretaker has come back to the lake and finally drags him away back to the den again not speaking to him this time. He's not really sure what he did wrong. It must just be some cultural difference that he has awkwardly stepped into. A day passes. Pilot spends his time mostly fading in and out of sleep or shuffling like a zombie outside every now and then to take care of hygienic matters. In his wakeful hours of which there are few he finds himself thinking about the logistics of his situation. Is this the afterlife maybe? Another world. He's delirious enough to think it is. His wounds are vividly red and pulsating with a fire that snakes through his body. His feverish dreams are filled with vipers and flames both reaching out from the depths of the world as he flies tearing him down toward them. Each time he wakes up only to find caretaker changing a wound covering or reapplying an ointment. Every time his heart beats he's sure that the odd crusty hardened casts that the girl has sealed his injuries with are going to break off and crumble, but they never do. He's brought food but she doesn't bother trying to feed him anymore like yesterday instead just setting the bowl down and pointing at it saying a single word before walking off to do whatever it is she does all day. Pilot. Honestly it's better than any rations or canteen food that he's ever eaten and taste by leagues that cannot be compared even if his body protests against the noticeable lack of gristle cheap oils and processed industrial grain product in its nutrition as he downs another bowl of cold soup. She doesn't seem like much of a meat eater he's noticing. Pilot watches caretaker walk out of the small domicile that is nestled beneath the massive tree that he still hasn't quite managed to wrap his head around yet. The man stares at her antlers and perhaps not that confusingly her doe tail as she leaves. Weird. He's definitely not anywhere near home. Shrugging he eats and then tidies up the area to show his reciprocity though perhaps the final result looks more like one would find in a barracks rather than a home. Another day passes. Pilot is outside by the kestrel. He has to get the plane out of the water first. If he's lucky it'll still start and taxi when it's dried a little. Flying might be a bit of an ask, he isn't sure but getting it upright and ready will be a big help to him because Pilot as appears to be his name now rather than simply his profession stands there and stares at the Kestrel. Back in the old world they were stripped of their names after enlisting and given a designation instead. In a way this feels like that. Because What? Exactly? This clearly isn't home. The war that never ends isn't here. There's nothing here. He doesn't even need the plane, does he? He has some odd undefined mission from something to save the world tree, whatever the hell that means. But is this really something that concerns him? He has no investments here. Who gives a flying fuck about the world tree? He doesn't even remember the last time he touched an actual tree. 
His host caretaker is nice though, if not a bit strange. She doesn't look like someone who deserves to die. If some obscure danger is coming this way to burn down the tree then she's more like a civilian caught in the middle of it than a participating combatant from what he sees. As he thinks those thoughts something itches inside of him. He doesn't need the plane, he wants the plane. This place here, this paradise, is peaceful. It's beautiful. It's serene. Honestly, he might very well have crash-landed into heaven itself. If the ghost of the Pope came up and out of the woods that he had been shitting in and shook his hand right now, Pilate wouldn't blink twice about the matter. But that's what's bothering him the most. Men like himself don't go to paradise— and the thought of not having a weapon ready that he could have ready makes him uneasy as it should. All of his years of life in the war have taught him a simple lesson the unprepared die. He has a knife and a pistol with a few more shots worth of ammunition. That's not nearly enough for any sane man to fall asleep easily at night in a place like this. Sure the pistol now regenerates its ammunition every day. But what is he supposed to do with that? His 7.92 by 57 millimeters Personal sidearm is loaded with one single eight-round standard detachable box magazine. Eight shots a day. Infinite yes, but only limited. The Kestrel meanwhile shoots 33 bullets. Per second. Which sadly are currently not infinite in their supply. The thought of this being a possibility gives him the indescribable fuzzies, however. There are clearly rules at play here in this world that would allow this to happen somehow, right? If it works for the pistol, it can work for the Kestrel's dual-mounted machine guns, too. Right. So in the end, the two weapons can't be compared. With only a sidearm, he's practically buck-naked out here. Nervously the scarred soldier eyes the chirping colorful birds whistling beautiful songs in the trees. The water splashes behind him as fish jump chasing after the sunlit reflections atop the water of paradise. The petals of gossamer flowers drift gently through the air carried by a soft pleasant wind. The graces of an everlasting most peaceful spring make themselves felt on his skin with the kiss of the sun's warmth. If he wants to survive and escape this nightmarish hellscape then he needs to get the Kestrel ready before he goes insane. How can anyone live in a place like this? Pilot watches the forest as the nearby birds fly flocking into the sky and cutting through the early morning fog. There is no roaring line of artillery hammering the world. The ground is in scorched gray and dead having been sterilized by fire and poison generations ago. The air isn't caustic and acrid to breathe. There aren't as many skulls on the ground as there are rocks in a quarry. Endless fires don't spread across the horizon filling the night with a de-equivalent shine. Poison gas doesn't roll across the hills like early morning fog. Maybe this really is the afterlife. Maybe this place is hell. This isn't what life is supposed to be like. This place here is sick and wrong. I need ropes, says Pilate to himself going into the nearby forest and trying to find anything usable but finds nothing of the sort. There are all manner of plants and fungi here the likes of which he's never seen. His survival training hasn't prepared him for this. But the girl caretaker has one, doesn't she? In her home. Pilot makes his way back the antlered girl staring at him as she sits there separating the petals of many flowers into many baskets around her. He points at a rope on the wall looking at her. Caretaker, says the man nudging the rope and looking at her. She eyes him curiously and then nods. Thanks, says Pilot taking the rope and heading back to the kestrel. It's handwoven and feels ridiculously strong. Caretaker is talented in making things it seems. Wrapping the rope around the airframe and then around a tree pilot climbs into the cockpit wiping away crusted blood as he checks the brake to see if it's released it is and then deploys the landing gear. The wheels drop out of the frame. 
pilot climbs out again, pulling on the rope as hard as he can, straining himself. This goes on for a while not so successfully, as he can't really exert himself all that much with his wounds. Pilot, says an annoyed voice from the side. He looks at caretaker who has come down to the lake. She walks over examining his construction and then grabs the end of the rope nodding to him. He nods back and the two of them pull at the same time. He can only assume that she's helping so that he doesn't tear open his own wounds again. The kestrel slides onto the shore the thick wide wheels rolling over the wet crystal sand as the plane slowly comes out of the water which pours down its metal frame leaking out of the gaps in the wings and body. Pilot sighs in relief looking at the plane which seems to be in one whole piece sort of. Caretaker lets out some quietly curious ooze as she examines the body of the plane feeling along it with her palms as she seems to try to understand how exactly it has come to be. It seems very likely that she has no idea what a plane even is. Some ranking officer would probably try to put him against the wall for letting a civilian look at the experimental aircraft so closely even if it's a survival situation. And when he does make it into the air thanks to her help he can assume that the theoretical orders from above would be to execute her and any other witnesses before flying back to base. That's what war is. The enemy can't know about the Kestrel's abilities. But again there is no enemy. There is no war. There is nothing here that would incline him to move down such a path. But as caretaker turns his way looking in confusion as she knocks on the plane as if seemingly wondering if he could somehow possibly explain what it is somehow to her with their limited shared vocabulary he finds his hand still idly resting on the pocket holster for his sidearm as his eyes warily scan the area. The bushes rustle behind him. Pilot spins around pulling out the pistol with a quick draw and aiming it dead center at the fat gray rabbit which peeks out of the underbrush staring curiously toward them with big round eyes that match its body. He can't help but notice the sound of laughter coming from behind him all of a sudden. Pilot sighs turning around to look at caretaker who is clutching her stomach and clearly not bothering to hide her amusement at all only ever stopping herself as her laughter hurts her own hurting body. Caretaker stands up straight comically mimicking his rigid posture as she copies his movements pointing her fingers at the bushes too before laughing again. The rabbit runs away. Pilot moves quickly. He lifts his hands a second time aiming the pistol her way and pulls the trigger. A single crack echoes through the air the gunshot disrupting the day's long peace in the valley. A single body flops down to the sands falling from the back of the plane that it had crept up unseen. Caretaker yells in surprise running and scrambling away as a new goblin that had been sneaking up on her oozing black blood out of its shot belly yells and writhes in the sand staining them with its leaking bile from the gut wound. He fucking knew it. The goblin's there in the goddamn forest. Anything that looks like this place is too good to be true. Paranoid, he scans the area for any more Tango enemy forces before moving to the screaming creature on the lake shore. Pilot walks over holstering his pistol and kicks the crude stone knife on the sand away from the monster's reaching hand as he pulls out his own standard-issue survival knife from his boot holster. With his foot he rolls the small green creature over on its back and without a second thought pushes the blade down cleanly through its throat and through the bones of its spine on the far end. The small monster shakes and spasms, dying instantly. The battle is over. Pilot has killed Goblin. Plus 10 EXP. He watches the monster's death rattle play out, not rising to his feet until it is fully dead. I want my plane, says the man simply to the world as he gets up. Pilots as a profession have a pretty bleak long-term survival prognosis, but infantrymen? Those are some grim numbers. Machine guns, mines, gas artillery, and bullets of more variety and caliber than there are stars in the sky are plenty to worry about. That's not including the sepsis trench foot and everything else they get to deal with. Are you good? He asks looking over at caretaker who is still in the sand she had stumbled down into. 
He reaches down helping her up which she lets him do not replying as she stares in pale shock at the new monster. The goblin is lightly armored and has no equipment except a knife and some survival tools. This goblin just like the last one is a scout. Scouts are the front of the front lines the first boots to break into enemy territory before the army follows after their blazed trail. These ugly creatures seem smart enough to make and use their own tools, clothes, and packs. If these two that he has already killed are here that means there are more in the forest. There is likely a small scouting party. The rest of the goblin army, or their tribe, or whatever hole that they might function as is very soon to come. In seven days if he was a betting man. Pilot picks up the small corpse straining himself as he looks it over making sure. The 7.92 by 57 millimeters bullet didn't penetrate the flesh and fly into the kestrel and then gracelessly tosses the dead thing out of the way and away from the water so that it doesn't contaminate it. Caretaker begins fussing about something again breaking her silence as he moves the corpse but Pilot ignores her needing to know something. He climbs into the cockpit running through the ignition protocol before hitting the engine starter taking back his prior blasphemous thoughts about the Pope from before as he says a prayer in his mind. His finger flicks the ignition switch. And there the mechanism roars. Plus, plane activated, plus. Jagged Flugzig 09 Kestrel has been activated. Abilities have been unlocked. New Ability Mechanics, repair damage, small. Active. Cost. Zero four, soul plus, raw material. Allows the repair of any exterior surface level damage to your plane's airframe without advanced tools or stations. Requires compatible raw or processed metal to use. New ability. Aviation, check vehicle status. Active. Cost. Zero one soul. Allows the examination of the full status of the Kestrel and its components. Includes a manifest of damaged items and suggested repair or exchange opportunities. Vehicle status. Core airframe. Fuselage. Propulsion system. Seance drive. Wing left. Wing right. Fuel system. 0.4%. Cockpit. Tail section. Landing gear. Navigation systems. Radio systems. Armor. Armaments. Curzons under. 7.92 by 57. MM machine guns 02. Explosive mass cluster ordinances. August 8th. High Explosive Self-Destruction Payload.